Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. All right, and we got a good fantasy writing guest for you. Well, actually, he's done a few things. We'll talk about uh, David Estes. Am I saying your right, name right, David? It's only five letters, but I can totally mispronounce it. That's actually really impressive because most people either think I'm maybe, I don't know, Mexican, Estes, or something else. All right, well, David, something else, <laughs> Estes, is uh, joining us tonight. He's going to talk about kind of, he's done a couple different genres, and um, his launch of his epic fantasy, I guess, epic military fantasy series last year is uh, still going strong after a year. So we're going to kind of ask him how he did his launch and how he's kept things sticking. And uh, let me just quickly read the bio off of Amazon. David has written more than 30 science fiction and fantasy books, his most famous of which are Fate Marked, Slip, and The Moon Dwellers. He has a love of dancing and singing, but only when no one is looking or listening. He's a mad, skilled ping pong player, an obsessive Goodreads group member, and prefers writing at the swimming pool to writing at a table. He lives in Hawaii with his wife, son, and asthmatic cat. How come you go to the swimming pool instead of uh, to the ocean? You know, I have done the ocean as well. Um, but usually if you're near a swimming pool, there's some form of shade. And I, I, wrote, I wrote one book on Waikiki Beach, and I fried my, my laptop right at the end of it. So, <laughs> All right, that sounds good. I, I do remember I swam as a kid competitively, and the monotony of <laughs> just doing laps for two hours, it was a good time to think about things. That's true. Well, why don't you tell us how you got into writing and um, have you, have you self-published all of yes, your stuff? I, or? I, I've self-published all eBooks and paperbacks and then I just have a, a few audio books with Podium. All right. Well, what brought you to uh, this industry? <laughs> well, obviously I'm an accountant, so that just flows perfectly into writing. Um, okay. Maybe not so much. I think that's the other side of my brain, but I actually, I moved to Australia and did this whole life odyssey and that was actually as an accountant but then I met somebody who's a lot smarter than me that's my wife Adele she's an Australian and I was in between jobs and I had the next job lined up and she said what are you gonna do what are you gonna do for three weeks and um, I said well there's that beach right over there so I might just sit on that for a while and she said that's a waste of time you should start writing that book that you always talked about so that was about seven years ago and so I started writing a book and seven years later, um, I am no longer, I got rid of all the accounting stuff and now I am, um, I've been writing books for seven years and I've, I've published 30 plus novels, science fiction and fantasy. And my son, my son just decided to join me. He is, he's two years old and he's, he's moving like a cow. So that's another part of my life that's very inspiring. We usually have dogs that show up and randomly <laughs> take off or start drinking water. That's how it is. <laughs> yeah. My, my, wife, my wife managed to wrangle him, which is another part of my life. That's good that she's there for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you seem to enjoy writing in a few different genres, or I should say. I mean, they all look like they're sci-fi and fantasy, but uh, you've done dystopian, it looks like, and maybe some children's stories early on yeah th that's correct i i started writing um mostly science fiction dystopian type stuff um and then i got into children's just because i always had this love of love of children's literature and so i wrote this really cool kids um superhero series but um you know it's, it was a lot harder to sell than the dystopian thing so i i focused more on kind of the dystopian um until i felt like i was getting burned out writing the same genre too much and so that's when I went and just totally went towards epic fantasy. And that's what I've been doing for the last two years or so. Uh, all right. So um, you uh, jump around to different fan uh, uh, genres. Uh, do you find that um, your followers like follow you to different genres? Or do you have people who are sort of always rooting for the previous thing to be happening? Like, do they have favorites that they sort of cause rivalry within your uh, your your audience yeah you know i was i was very worried about that when i made such a drastic switch um but what i had been finding is i was having fewer followers go from one dystopian end of the world type scenario to the next one and i was having a, 
a lower number of sales from series to series as I was sticking with the same genre. And so I thought it was time to take a bit of a risk and go somewhere else. And what I think I found was that those particular readers who had kind of set, gotten burnt out on the dystopian thing and stopped following me from series to series, they, I actually captured their attention again. And I brought some of them back into it because they said, oh, here's something completely different we haven't seen from this author who we really liked from this series, you know, four years ago, five years ago that he wrote. And so um, I, had, I had the best launch I'd ever had with my, epic fan, my new epic fantasy series. All right. So, okay. You, you've written in dystopian and then you also do the epic fantasy. Do you actually put any sort of, you know, like, like for instance, like in your front matter, your back matter, your books and say, okay, by the way, I'm starting a new series or if you like this one, try that one sort of thing. I was just wondering, cause I've also, I also do two different genres and I haven't really decided if I want to put say, well, but if you like my fantasy, try the mystery or whatnot. I don't necessarily do that. So I was wondering if you do something similar. Yeah. You know, I, I haven't done it in the front matter. Um, just because I found with mostly whenever I open up a new book on my Kindle, it jumps right into the first chapter and you actually have to go backwards if you want to see any of that front matter stuff. So I found that is maybe less valuable of kind of a, an area, but definitely at the end of the books, you know, I'm trying to get people into the next book in the series, but then I'm also, if they really enjoy what they hear, I'm also trying to get them into my other genres. And I feel sci-fi and fantasy as a reader myself, I jump between those two genres and I like to mix it up between the two. So um, I, what I try to do is I pick, because I've got a super huge backlist, I try to pick the book in the sci-fi genre that will, I think will most resonate with the readers of this particular fan fantasy series because of other attributes, like the fact that it has a lot of characters, complex character growth, um, side storylines, all of those types of things. Do you put like any sort of snippets or anything or any excerpts in the back of those things? Say, um, you know, I, give this a try. Yeah. yeah, I do. I usually, I usually do excerpts um, from the next book in the series first, and I don't want to put too many other excerpts and things. So I wait until the last book in the series, the fifth book in this Fate Mark series. That's when I put an excerpt in of the next, the next series I want to get them into, which is one of my backlist ones. So when you actually first decided to launch the epic fantasy after doing dystopian, um, how did you go about, did you like plug it to your regular list or did you try ads or what, would, what did you do for the launch that seemed to work really well? Yeah, um, because I wasn't really sure of how things would go, I started out about, I've been working on it for kind of a long time. So sorry, that's my, my son is back and he's, <laughs> he doesn't understand why he can't be a part of this whole conversation. Um, so I, I started out about two months or so before the launch. I had already written the first three books in the series and I was working on the fourth one. So I had kind of everything scoped out for the series and I just started prepping my, the, my current list of readers on Facebook, Goodreads. I have a really big Goodreads fan group, uh, well, decent size, 30, 30 to 3000 to 3,500. And I just started prepping them and said, it's been a long time since I published anything over a year but here's what this is all about. Here's some cool concept art that I had done. Here's what the first cover looks like. Here's, what, here's where this story might lead. Um, here's kind of the scope of it. Here are some character profiles, that sort of thing. That was about two months out. Then I did the pre-order thing about a month before, but I didn't go crazy with it. I didn't do any kind of paid advertising. I didn't really hit up my, my lists um, again and again. I just basically threw it out there one time at the beginning. And then just said, here, this is something you guys might be interested in. And so then I kind of just let that bubble along. And I didn't have, I didn't have tremendous sales of the pre-order. Um, I had a few here and there, mostly my super fans, the ones I could pretty much say, I know who's buying this on a day-to-day -day basis because they're telling me on Facebook. And then after that, on, on day one, I had a plan. And my plan was to kind of slow roll it as because I knew I was going to release every two weeks for the first three books until the end of month one, I would have three books out there. So what I did was day one, I hit up a couple of fantasy authors that basically were a big inspiration for, for me for the series who I knew on a, on a first name basis who I'd spoken to on the phone. And I said, Hey, if you guys would be willing to take a look at this, or if you don't have time to read it to just, mention it you know to your readers and do a little bit of cross promotion um i'll i'll respond in kind and do the same for you 
And so, so these were authors of books that were in the same genres that I wanted to reach the top of. And that was military fantasy on, on Amazon Kindle. And so I got a couple of really good mentions, one from a friend of mine, Mark Edelheit, who's um, written Steiger's Tigers, and he had done tremendously well in the military fantasy genre. And so that, that from day one got things going in the right direction. It populated my also bots. It got me kind of in the right genres. And right away, you know, I was in the top 30, maybe I, I reached top 20 that first week in that military fantasy genre. And from then, it was, it was just a, it was a slow build. All right. So uh, military sci-fi is a genre that we, like, has a lot of traction and we've had a lot of people on the show like recommending it. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not as familiar with, with military fantasy. Like, is, how does it stack up? Is it a hungry audience? Yeah, you know, um, it started out kind of slow. It was an easier, I felt it was an easier category to kind of get into and reach the, the, the higher um, bounds of it. Um, lately, that has turned. So in the last month, Mr. Brandon Sanderson joined the ranks of, of um, the military fantasy group. And of course, Lindsay now has a book that has been sitting in the top one or two, depending on what the other book club deals are doing. Um, so she's dominated the top. When I came in, it was heavily dominated by Mark Edelheit, as well as a few others, including Evan Curry, who dominates in, in milita military sci-fi. He had a book that was in that top 10, um, as well as a guy by the name of Jonathan Moeller, who's written a ton of, of military fantasy type books. So those were actually, those three, three guys were the ones that I, start, I did my first big multi-author promo. And that was at the beginning of April, a month after the first three books had been out. And the three of us, the four of us ganged up together and just hit up our newsletters and basically said, these are all books that are in this military fantasy group in the top 20. And we think our readers will like all of them. And so when we did that, that was the first time that Fate Marked got into the top 10. All four of our books got into the top 10 during that time. And from there, things just continued to build. It's interesting, like you talk about how things have started to change. It's, it's interesting how much the landscape of a subgenre can change once different authors start to take notice and start putting their books into it. That's very true. And I mean, in some ways, it legitimizes those who have been there for a while. So, you know, as I, as I continued this upward climb of fate marks, um, like I said, it wasn't an instant success. It, was, it did well early on, um, but month by month, it got better and better until the beginning of July, that's when it finally hit that number one spot in the military fantasy genre. When it hit that number one spot, then it stayed there for about two months. Um, and that's when I, I guess I got the most visibility. Um, but now, sitting at number four, five, six, surrounded by the likes of Sanderson, he has about, he, has, he must have seven or eight, eight books in the top 10. Um, plus, then you have, you know, accomplished authors like Lindsay as well. It legitimizes my own book kind of being there. And I think then when people, readers do find that genre and decide they want to tackle a bunch of books in it, it kind of gives more credence to everyone that happens to be in the top 20 at that point. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I don't really read too much military sci-fi. So I was going to ask you, in your own opinion, what are some of the most common tropes that you feel should be included in military sci-fi titles? Um, to be honest, I haven't read as much um, military sci-fi. I've, I've definitely read more in the military fantasy. Um, although military I have, films. I have lit. Um, okay, great. Um, I was going to say Evan Curry, since he's written in both of them, he's kind of, he's definitely turned me on a little bit to, to military sci-fi. And I do have an interest in writing in that one too, but for now, military fantasy is what I've really, I've done the most in. And, um, you know, there's, you, you got the dragon, you've got the dragon stuff, um, for sure. And that's, I mean, I guess that's a function of, of just epic fantasy as well. Um, but within that, you've always, there seems to always be, you know, mythical creatures of some kind, um, as well as some form of enhanced humans, like an elf type culture um, or something to that effect, as well as, of course, you're always going to have some sort of great conflict that's lasted a substantial amount of time between serious superpowers, you know, you're thinking like ancient Rome. Um, what I haven't gotten into is because I'm not a huge history buff, 
But what Mark Edelheit has done is he does a lot of substantial research into ancient, you know, civilizations and their, their military, um, kind of their military standards and things of that nature and kind of incorporates some of that, like almost like a Roman legion um, type of feel to it. So that, that's kind of another sub, sub genre within it. Okay. And my and the second part to that particular question is of those tropes, are there any that you wish you wouldn't have to worry about or wish that you could omit or avoid? Um, for me, it's definitely the, the history side of things. I, I like to make up my own history. And I, I mean, I guess we all do, but I have no real interest in incorporating, um, like ha having all of my characters carry French style weapons with French names, for example, I would rather either stick to like a just standard, you know, names of, of weapons, um, or come up with my own new weapons that incorporate some form of magic. And that, that's another trope, you know, that's part of the military fantasy. That's the fantasy side of things because you've got, you've got the military, but then generally you have some kind of magic involved and creating your own magic system is obviously huge, something that Sanderson has excelled at and is, which is why his books are included in the genre. All right, and maybe we should mention for those listening who aren't stalking the categories every day, that this is a relatively new one on Amazon. I think it's only been out there for about a year and you still have to email to request to get in it, um, which is I've, I've only done it with like one book. I have a weird, I have two series where like the characters are all pilots and they're in their, their equivalent of their army. So they could all be in the military fantasy category, but I always feel like my stuff's like more towards swords and sorcery. And uh, yeah. dragons, of course. So I'm like, well, I don't know if I need to have every book in that category. But I would say for those uh, listening that want a really good example, I feel like Glenn, Glenn Cook's Black Company books are sort of like, for me, the epitome of, you know, it's like a mercenary company. And everything centers around the mercenary company. You know, and I feel like in epic fantasy, usually the main character is not a soldier. There may be like a soldier character. But I mean, I don't know. With yours, it, do you find that, is it about a unit or are the main characters officers or, or soldiers in your, your military that you've made up? I'm the same as you. I make up everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in Fate Marked, um, I ended up turning it into something that was so big that my list of characters that have their own points of view are numerous. Um, so you have, you have a smattering of them. You have some that are, you know, milit in a military, actual military position or even leading their military unit you have others that start out somewhere else and then end up in some form of a military unit and then you have still others that really have no interest in that side of things that are on completely separate quests that are still trying to accomplish the same thing which is essentially you know defeat the dark the forces of evil and restore peace yeah, I suppose in military fantasy too you'd often have like country versus country clashes just because yeah. that's where armies <laughs> they fight each other and that's what they do yes that's exactly right so i've i have i have my four kingdoms and they don't get along um and there's even a civil war amongst you know within one of those of those um kingdoms so there's there's plenty of that but at the same point i i, I don't try to make it about the about the wars it's about for me i'm more of a character driven storyteller so it's about the odysseys of these various characters and things like having a princess you know who's been spoiled her whole life and is quite a brat, um, have her father killed very early on to then, and then have something tr other, something else traumatic done to her, um, which, you know, hurts her beauty, which is something she's already always relied on. And then having her come to terms with that and then kind of turn things around and either take that to the side where she wants, all she wants is revenge and hate, or then maybe come back the other way and see how she can actually become an inspiration. So, I like those complex characters that have a lot of kind of gray area in the terms of the actions that they take. And, and yeah, it's more, for me, it's less about the military, more about the characters. It's nice that with fantasy, I feel like there's like, you don't necessarily have to have like these X, Y, Z tropes to, uh, for people to enjoy the stories. Some, I feel like in some other uh, subgenres, maybe people are more demanding. Like, I guess that's one of the reasons I haven't put a lot of my books in there because I feel like it'd be mostly male readers picking up the military, you know, surfing that category on Amazon. And um, I mean, I have male characters too, but I always have like really strong female characters and romance in there too. And so I don't know. I am like, would, would I be giving them what they expect to get in that category? But I've picked up some of the other books in there and 
there, I wouldn't consider them at all military fantasy. I, I think there's some people who are just taking advantage of the category not being very competitive yet. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, and you'll certainly see some, some oddball books end up in some of these categories that I'm a part of. Um, and that has, that has certainly been frustrating at times when, when I'm doing well in a category and then something pops in there that's not really at all related to that category. Um, you're certainly seeing genre stuffing is a very popular thing to do right now. I think Amazon, you know, they're, they're looking at ways of kind of combating that. But at this point, um, giving us access to basically request up to a certain number of categories has, has allowed you know, authors to take advantage. At least that's one category where you don't usually see the man chest <laughs> with the dragon tattoos or whatever <laughs> yet. Sometimes that can be in some of the other categories. You're like, mm, I'm not sure I call that epic fantasy, but whatever. Yes, right. Well, I'm curious, you, uh, you've got an audiobook deal with Podium. Uh, is that for several of your series or, or for the epic fantasy? Yeah, so that one started out with um, The Moon Dwellers, which that was, that was my dystopian series that had the most success. The first, the first dystopian that I wrote. Uh, that, that one gained some fame when it hit a book bub list, um, 15 or was it 10, 10, 10 or 15 series to read if you enjoyed The Hunger Games. And um, it was on a, this BuzzFeed list and then BookBub later picked it up on a similar type list. And that, that's really what gained it a lot of the spotlight considering the other books on the list were all the big ones that they had movie deals and things, Maze Runner and Divergent and City of Bones and all, all those types of books. So um, that's when Podium became aware of it. And they had, they had you know, recently landed The Martian and done great things with, with that series. And so they approached my agent and I and um, offered us a seven book deal on that one because that was a, it was two separate trilogies that then came together and collided into a seventh book. So they signed up for that and published that over, over about a two year period. Um, the last of which was um, earlier last year. And so shortly after that was finally finished, then I went back to them because I was very happy with, with the job that they did on it and the, the, their efforts, you know, one, it won some awards as well. Um, and I said, Hey, I got this new one. It's a different genre. I know that podium has a lot of success in epic fantasy. And so I kind of floated it with them and they gave me a five book deal on that one. What's your experience been as far as sales go with uh, audiobooks? I've kind of find it hit or miss with, in my own experience with the different genres and categories. And sometimes it's kind of hard to tell. Like I had one takeoff that was a three book omnibus. So that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, it was like 30 hours or something for one credit. How, how has your stuff been doing? Yes, kind of similar. Um, the Moon Dwellers, when they it released the, the individual audiobooks, it didn't do nearly as well, but then they bundled in into an omnibus and it did terrific um, for quite a while. And then when it came time to then do the other, the next, the other series, which was a separate trilogy that then would come together, that one, by then audio audible was cutting down on the bundling and that sort of thing. So they weren't able to do that. And that one has been a much slower burn, hasn't had the same um, success as the first three books did in that, in that bundled one. What I found with Fate March was released on January 27th, 28th, something like that, just a, a little over a week ago. And I don't know for sure because I don't have access to the, you know, real time sales numbers, but just looking at the rankings and things like that, it has done substantially better on launch than my other series did. And my belief is the, it's a function of, of how well the series fits in audio, in audio, as well as, you know, how well the narrator, narrator kind of brings it to life. Um, I got Derek Perkins, who's got this really cool English accent um, and has done some other epic fantasy really knows how to kind of handle that type of a epic series um, so I, I think he's done a great job on it so that that should help it as well as how well is how well is the series doing in general um, and my the ebook I've been very fortunate um, I know you mentioned it earlier on that we're here a year almost a year later from when Fate March was, first came out now that all five books are out and somehow beyond any expectation I had it's still you know ranked in the top 2500 on Amazon which is huge for me uh, when my dystopian stuff had drifted way off that mark. Um, so I, I, was, I was just hoping to get a few good months out of it. And now to have this kind of longevity, that really makes me feel like now the audio could be another kind of you know, saga in, in, its, um, in its experience. Um, how Do you consider uh, audiobooks to be sort of an important part of your business now? Like, are they sort of part of your 
you know, strategies and all that? Um, I would say that in the last six months or so, I have brought it into my, my overall strategy. Whereas previously, I had the seven book series with Podium. I certainly appreciate getting that quarterly check, but I didn't plan for it. They came to me. I had never thought of audiobooks. I wasn't an audiobook listener. I didn't re even realize how popular they'd become and kind of that trajectory they're on. So it's really only in the last kind of six to nine months. Um, I've, I've, I'm, in a, I'm in a Slack group with a number of other fantasy writers in my genre, which includes some pretty big names like Michael J. Sullivan and some others that have had tremendous success with audiobooks and actually counts on that for a substantial portion of their business. And they, they opened my eyes in a big way as to how important it is um, and get in front of it early and include it in all of your plans for the series and be thinking about it when you're actually writing the, the original print ebook. Do you find that, have you, do you have any indication that maybe the audiobooks have a different audience than the ebooks? Like you might be reaching new people with them? I absolutely think that's true. Um, I, I have, I've certainly, I've had a number of those who read the books already and said, oh, when they heard it came, was going to come out on audio, they said, oh, that's great. I'll listen to it as well. And that's awesome to get those, you know, kind of hit the re same reader in a couple different ways. But then I had a substantial number as well who said, oh, I'm a big fan of yours, but I don't really have time to read anymore. I mostly listen to audiobooks in the car, in the commute, whatever it is. And they said, when is it coming out? And at that point, I didn't have a deal. And I said, I, I hope, you know, I hope it eventually will, but I didn't have any plans at the time. And so the more and more kind of emails and Facebook messages and whatnot I got from people like that made it pretty clear that there's, there's another audience out there that you can't capture with the ebook and the print. And so you can either turn a blind eye and just let them get, slip away, even though they're interested in, in what you do, or you can pursue them heavily. <clears throat> okay, so with regards to the audiobooks that you've released or have had released, is there anything we wish you could have changed? I mean, is there anything you wish you could have done differently? Um, I mean, I, I, I think I, it was a good route to go for a newcomer to the genre to have a tried and true publishing house um, handle the production. You know, it's the choice of a narrator is obviously a critical um, critical part of that process and you lose a bit of control when you go to a publisher like that you know they do listen they do listen to you and and you can certainly offer up suggestions but they only have some so much control as well based on the schedules of the various narrators that they work with so you know I, I definitely regret nothing with Derek Perkins for Fate Mark he's the perfect guy for it with the Moon Dwellers um, with that seven book series we actually have a number of narrators because we pretty much have a different narrator for every book. So that's certainly a factor. I had a variety of narrators, some of which they definitely weren't all created equal. Um, and so I, I wish I had a little bit more, I don't know, um, control over that aspect of, of things. Yeah, that's the one good thing about if you go through ACX or whatever and produce your own is you can listen to like 50 different people's voices and pick yeah. just the right person. Yeah, I am. Um, you can even go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say you can even. You, say you, can even, you can even reach out to somebody who you just absolutely love for it, and you think they're the right person. Um, and that's what I did with. I've only done one ACX, and that was that was a, my only standalone, which I must say hasn't really sold either an audiobook or ebook. But I, I I had a narrator in mind. That was Kate Rudd, who's very successful. And I had a connection through someone else to her and I was able to get her to do it. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, the only downside was it, it didn't, it didn't really sell. That is the problem with doing it through ACX is that you actually want to make back the money <laughs> that you spent on producing yes. it. And if it's a long book, it's like, Correct. it could be like $5,000. Correct. And your books are pretty long, at least the epic fantasy I was looking at, book one was 19 hours. And do you think that really helps? I, I feel like it would. My book ones are always on the shorter side. And then as the series goes on, you know, they become longer and longer. But I always feel with Audible yeah. that people are like, I got my one credit. I'm going to get as yeah. many hours as I can with it. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, I think it's also true to some degree in, the, in this genre with the eBooks as well. 
not necessarily for uh, my fate marks is in Kindle Unlimited. So obviously they don't really care. They can read for free. So they're, they're, the length isn't going to really affect them. But when I'm charging three ninety nine for the first book and five ninety nine for each of the sequels, those five ninety nine ones, I mean, for, for a lot of readers, that's, that's a, that's a big part of their book budget for that particular week or that month or whatever it is. And I like to offer them, especially in a genre like this, as much value as I can. So I think that has helped. Um, my, like you said, the sequels get tend to get longer and longer. So with this series, the, the audible, um, time frames or, or what I guess, whatever the durations uh, will go up, you know, to 25 and 30 hours for the later books in the series. Yeah, that's definitely a good deal for those who have the subscription and are, you know, they see that they're getting a book that would cost $30 or more otherwise for their $14 credit or whatever it was. Exactly. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what you've been doing for marketing. You mentioned that you launched your first three books kind of back to back, two weeks apart. Was that, uh, I mean, we've definitely seen that a lot of this, that's worked for a lot of people. Do you think that was super important in getting some momentum going in the new genre for you? I believe it was super important. I also can't really claim that much credit for it. And here's why I, I my agent um, was pitching heavily pitching fate marked and, and had an, a bit of interest. You know, I got, we got about 10 or 12 full manuscript requests from big publishers. And so we were just at their mercy as we always are sitting there waiting to hear back for our normal rejections. And we did eventually get those 10 to 12 rejections. And so in the meantime, the, the good thing about all that is like you pointed out, I had a chance to then write the other books. And since these are so long, I really needed about a year to write the three books, which is a lot longer. Normally I could do five or six books in a year. And by the time I got to the end of that first year and we kind of got our final no, then I started, you know, I had to have that sit down, refocus. I'm not going to get a big deal. I'm going to need to do this myself as I've done many times before. And so that's when I started planning the launch and I started looking at some other very successful stories of those who had released quite quickly. And so I thought two weeks felt like a pretty sweet spot, especially given the length of the books that would give a reader on day one, plenty of time to read the first one and then be ready to gobble up the next one um, and, and grab it on day one to also then help the launch sales and the algorithms and all of that. And so by the end of once I released the, the third book, um, on, I believe it, I believe it was the very last day in March, March 31st, which was a month after the first book, which came out on March 1st. That's when I did my first multi-author promo and I did a bunch of paid advertising or paid, paid promotion sites. And I discounted to 99 cents on the first book to just get as many people in the door at that point. And that worked extremely well. That was the first kind of where I saw quite a nice boost in sales. Then what I did is as soon as that hit, I started planning the next one, which was going to be two months later while I was still working on the fourth book. So I did the same thing two months later, but with different authors included. Um, so I did another multi-author promo and I hit up some, some different paid advertising sites. And so I kept that going. In the meantime, I was starting to make some money off of it. So the risk was going away. I had paid off all my co upfront costs and I had profits. And so rather than just kind of putting those into the bank account, I started building my budget for paid advertising, both or on Amazon, on Facebook, and on BookBub, which I had only dabbled in previously. And each month that got better than the previous one in terms of sales, I would take a percentage of those profits and roll them into the next month's advertising budget and just continue to build on it until I had a pretty, a pretty solid daily budget. Um, and I actually ended up, I, I was kind of tracking my ads very carefully to see what kind of return I was getting on them um, and became a bit of a student of the whole advertising process. And what I found was the BookBub ones, which had previously been big flops for my sci-fi stuff, ended up having the best conversion rates and had the most noticeable impact on sales and sales ranking. So I started move, shifting money away from Amazon, which you can't reliably spend what you want to spend anyway, and Facebook, which you can spend what you want to, but I wasn't seeing as great of an impact from it. And I moved that into BookBub. And I really haven't looked back. That's BookBub ads are about 80% of my spend right now. Yeah, I've definitely found on Facebook, I've gotten to the point where I can get it down to like 10 or 11 cents for a click or something, which I know some people do great, but I started at like 70 cents a click. So that's good. But I used yeah. the affiliate links and I was like, well, not that many people are actually buying. 
I mean, the books were in Kindle Unlimited, so some of them might have been borrowing. But uh, for me, in this last series, my swords and sorcery, military epic fantasy, whatever it is between the lines, <laughs> uh, you know, I found with this one, the Amazon ads really worked well. I tried like five different ones, and it, it was the case where like two are doing all the lifting, and the other ones, I can't yep. even spend my money on those. But uh, this time, I yeah. didn't find the BookBub ads worked real well for me, but I had found in another genre that they worked well. So it does seem like it's just kind of depending on your genre and your particular book. Sometimes one works better than the others. That's interesting that you're finding, how are you tracking the sales on the book bub? Are you using affiliate links or just kind I'm of? Using a, yeah, I'm using affiliate links and, and obviously with the K, with the KU page reads and things, you have to kind of, it's more of an art than a science, but you know, I try to look for increases over a period of time after I ramp up my budget to book bub and things like that. But the other interesting thing I'll point out is that, even with these BookBub ads, I, I tried probably five or six different versions. And what I found worked for this particular book, and I can probably not, I, I likely cannot replicate it for any other book or for anyone else's book, was, and there's, there goes my cat, <laughs> Bailey. Um, she's been locked inside here for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, and so I, if, if I try to replicate it, I, I can't really necessarily do it, but for this book, all it is, it doesn't have my book cover. It has an image, a stock image that I purchased of a king warrior looking guy standing on a cliff holding a sword in the air. And then down below, you can see kind of his army all spread out on the battlefield. And I have a quote from a reviewer who really enjoyed the series. That's an extremely positive quote, but quite short. And I don't put it in big flashy print. I put it in quite small print. So somebody really would have to inspect it kind of lean in take a look to read all the words and then at the bottom i just have free on kindle unlimited and my targeting has been completely other authors um, readers of other authors that are in kindle unlimited and that i think would cross over well to mine and for some reason this is the only ad of the first five or six that i put together that has really stuck and i've been running it now for since the beginning of, of July, really, until now, pretty steadily. I've tweaked budgets and, and bids and things like that, but it's continued to just run on a daily basis for me. I've definitely found with the BookBub campaigns that I've done that I'll do the same thing, like make about six ads. And usually the, whatever one I don't think is the best one is actually the one that gets the most clicks. <laughs> but that's right? it. I thought this one, yeah, I thought this one was pretty basic and it didn't, I had flashier ones that I thought were more eye-catching and they didn't do anything. I do think I, one I had that worked really well with my pen name series last summer also had a little short snippet from a reviewer that kind of, I don't, it was like sexy geeks in space or something. I don't know, it really encapsulated <laughs> what it was. Yeah. So that's a good tip, I think, to try those and to try a bunch of different ones because you never know which one is really going to. Exactly. And can I ask? Can I ask? Was was your uh, was yours cost per click or was it CPM? Mine were both cost per cost per click. The uh, yeah. campaigns because they just started the CPM one. I think a couple months ago. Is that what has your experience no, been? It was the I think it was the other way around. So they had the CPM originally, and then they recently started doing the the cost. That's per right. Click you're stuff. right. Yeah. Um, so I got in the beta group for the the cost per click. I guess because I had already spent you know over some amount on CPM. Um, and I was running both at first and then I found that the, the cost per click win, it always wins for me just because there's not the risk of having a really poor click through rate and then you spending money without getting any clicks. At least, you know, you're going to get the clicks, even if they might end up costing you a little bit more, you, you're only paying when you do get the click. So I, I, I didn't have to monitor. I used to have to monitor on a, you know, almost hourly basis because if a if an ad wasn't performing wasn't getting click-through rates then i wanted to shut that down very quickly so it wasn't just spending money for nothing. yeah that's a, a good point and i will definitely do that with my next campaign i usually only bother with the book ones and for the first couple of weeks of the yeah. launch and uh, you know after yeah. that i'm like well it either stuck or it didn't and <laughs> i'm working on the next series now but uh i write fast yes. so that's i go through them quickly um can i ask for those who are curious um, if you want to say like how much you're spending each month on the pay-per-click ads in order to keep your books kind of in the top 2000, at least I think still. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cause I, I actually found, cause I, I had started spending about 
um, 80 bucks a day. So 25, somewhere between two and 3000 bucks a month. Um, and that was, that had got them solidly in the top 2000 and it pretty much had stayed there for a substantial amount of time. And then I slowed down my spending because I was thinking, am I, is this really working? I mean, I can see some return on the investment, but is the organic, is it at such an organic point that I could be saving this two to 3000 bucks a month and continue to have this level of sales or at least something close. And I found it, Fate Mark had its worst dip was it dropped back to like 7,000 and it was in between seven and 8,000. I was worried it was going to fall out of the top 10,000 and then into that black hole of books that didn't quite make it. Um, so I ramped the spend back up and now I'm spending about the same. So I usually spend on ads per day between 70 and a hundred dollars. I was in the wrong window. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's substantial. It's, it's, it's encouraging to know that like there was that direct, a, a, a control, like direct link between the advertising and the, and the, uh, the sales. You don't often have, uh, as clear an indicator that this is working and I should keep doing it. That's very true. Yeah. There's, that's why everyone gravitates towards, towards things like book pub because they're kind of, a guaranteed deal and you know you're going to get that big return on your investment and other ones you think it's working but you're not really sure and you're afraid you're almost afraid to turn it off because is that all that's kind of holding you up and with this one i wouldn't say i'm afraid to turn it off but i i have no reason to turn it off simply because it has sustained me this far and it's kept like i said a, a year in and i'm still i'm still achieving great sales um, ratings plus it helps once, as, as you guys probably know, I mean, once you have either the whole series finished or a number of books out in the series, it takes a lot of the risk away with spending that ad dollar on book one or that promo dollar on book one because you don't have to capture nearly as many readers to ensure that you get that money back plus a return. Yeah, it's very true. Now, when, when you're doing your promotional budget and you're planning your promotion, how much do you focus on say the most recent series versus trying to get the back catalog selling? Um, well, I had, a, I had a bit of a strange journey because when the moon dwellers took off, I had to do very little to promote it. And I was getting book bub deals quite easily because all I had to do was show them this Buzzfeed article to basically legitimize myself. So I, I got over the course of four years, four or five years, I probably got, 14, 15 book bub deals for that series, um, as well as for then the, the subsequent series that I wrote. And then what happened was sales started to drift away. The Hunger Games was finished. Divergent was finished. People were, it, were inundated with all these end of the world and dystopian stories. And I hadn't learned the ropes of how to really sell a book over a period of time and maintain sales over a period of time. And so I had started writing this, you know, Fate Mark series and sales of my other series had really dwindled to the point where I was getting pretty nervous about it. And then what I, I guess I, as soon as Fate Mark started to, to sell early on, I pretty much went full steam ahead on that, promoted front list, front list, front list as I was writing the sequels and just completely ignored my backlist. The great thing about that was is after the front list started to have such significant success, I had more money to work with. So I could start to think of then about the backlist and what I wanted to do, if anything. Um, they were all in Kindle Unlimited. It just wasn't working for them. And so I went wide. I um, spent some time on rebranding a little bit um, on some of them. And then I started applying for book bubs again once, once I was wide. And I landed two book bubs on my backlist, one in December and one in January. And so that was, that was a good feeling. I don't want to spend, you know, too much of my time on the backlist, but at the same time, I don't want to just ignore it completely because that's an asset that I have. And if I, and I've learned, you know, the competition is such that if you do ignore, if you do ignore your series for too long, eventually it's just going to dwindle into obscurity. You've mentioned before that you've used pre-orders. I mean, are you, are you, are you a fan of them? And I mean, if you use them, I mean, how far in advance do you schedule your release with those pre-orders? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of talk about this cause everyone's worried about, you know, what's the best way to, to tickle the Amazon algorithm. And if you do it too soon and you hit it too hard, 
then you know you're not really getting all those sales on launch and so it's not recognizing you as a top seller right away my my feeling is after after the way i did fate marks was like i said a month before i did a pre-order um but i didn't really push it because i'd heard all of these things plus i didn't really know how popular the series was going to be so I just kind of let it bubble all along naturally. I just like to have it out there. So the readers of my other series, when they got to the end of it, they would see the ad. My next series is coming. It's available for pre-order. They could potentially grab it at that point. I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose those readers at that point. Um, then on the sequels, well, the first, the first two, obviously I released them in a very short period of time. So I had those ones up within two weeks of their, their dates. And again, it's, it's a, it's a function of not wanting to lose readers. So, if somebody gets the end of it and there's no pre-order available for the next book or it's not out yet, then it's that opportunity might pass by for them to continue on, especially Kindle Unlimited readers who are extremely voracious. They can get the next book for free anyway. They want to just move on to the next thing. So um, I guess I try, to, I try to capture those readers as soon as possible. So I guess with book four, which didn't come out for four months after book three, I had the pre-order up as early as I could. So basically the full, I think, what is it, 90 days or something like that. I had it up for the full period of time um, and ended up getting, you know, a thousand, two thousand, something like that sales in that pre-order period, um, which was completely unexpected. And then um, I ended up releasing it early. So then all those readers got kind of a surprise when it came about a month early. And that was actually when I hit all of my highest rankings were when it, when it came out um, a month early, the fourth book. So, so I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, long story short, I really think, I think with the sequels, you have very little to lose because it's your chance to grab the reader and basically force them to continue with the series right after they finish the first one and they're excited about it. With book one, um, I probably, if I were to do a pre-order again, I would do a shorter one um, and maybe only a, a few days before the launch just to start promoting it a little bit early and, and get sales in um, before the big burst on launch day. Yeah, I'm of the same mind with uh, book one. I actually did put my pre-order up a little earlier. I was going to play with advertising and then Amazon sent out a email to my list or my readers that follow yes, me on exactly. Amazon. And so I got this big bump of sales like a week before the release. And then I was like freaking out. I'm like, it's going to start plummeting because I don't have anything lined <laughs> up. But I think if you do it three or four days early, that gives it time to, you know, the also bought start to populate and you're yeah. going to, your categories are going to show up. And I agree with you that you might as well with the later books, better to get those people to click and order it while they're still excited about it. Uh, especially those KU folks, they, uh, well, I guess they wouldn't be ordering the pre-orders because they're just going to read it when it comes out. True. But, yeah. uh, you know, they read so much, the people that are really voracious that even if they read one or two of your books, they might forget about it if it's going to be three or four months later. So you mentioned that the reason you were able to launch three of these long epic fantasy books at once was you were kind of doing the agent thing. And so they were just in a holding pattern. But as we've talked about, that's actually a really good strategy. But I'm curious, how are you keeping the, you're still publishing them pretty quickly considering they're like 850 pages. Uh, do you have any <laughs> tips for folks that are trying to be more prolific or that are writing the longer books like that? Um, yeah, I, for, for me, and I'm sure as it has been for you as well, I've, I developed very early on a strict writing habit, um, that works for me, maybe for other people that doesn't work as well, but I need to write at the same time every day. It's got to be first thing in the morning, you know, pretty much breakfast, coffee, go. And I do write to a word count goal, which it's changed over time. Um, uh, for a while it was much higher, which, which allowed me to write kind of a lot of a lot of books in a short amount of time, you know, I was more in the, the five to 6,000 words a day range. But now that I have a growing family um, that takes up more of my time, I've cut that back to something that just works for me. So mine, mine's 3,000 words a day, but I'm very strict on that. I don't take days off. Um, I, I, you know, that's part of my daily life, like brushing my teeth is or things like that. The other thing to, to allow me to do this is I have to really be fully invested in the project. I mean, we're talking five books that are, you know, in total or over more than 4,000 pages long. 
for me to really to have tackled this, I needed to have um, characters that I totally not necessarily understood everything about them, but I believed in them and the growth that they needed to go through. So the, with this one, because I had so many characters, if one part of the story wasn't really catching me and just making me want to get out of bed and dive in to write that story, then I would push it aside and either rethink it, what, what that side of the story I had in my mind, with changing it to something that, was, that excited me more, um, or just let it kind of simmer for a while while I hit something else that was really capturing my interest. So I think when you're writing something that epic, it certainly pays to have multiple storylines because then you can focus on whichever one happens to be, you know, your flavor of the week um, that catches your interest at any given time. And that allows me to get up, be excited about what I'm doing and not struggle. I, I didn't, with this series, and you can, I think that, that also goes to why it's been successful is I, I had no semblance of writer's block. Not once did I struggle to get out of bed and, you know, groan about having to work on this series that wouldn't end type of thing. I was so excited about the end game and how every, all these meandering journeys, you know, would eventually come together in the final one. So um, that was all very important for me. Yeah, uh, it's definitely good. Like if you can stay excited, that's definitely good. And multiple, multiple uh, storylines and p point of views are a great way to do it. So you're producing also, by the way, a great way to end up with a very long book. <laughs> and uh, since you're producing longer books, do you, do you like take that into consideration when you set the price? Do you feel like people will tolerate a higher price on a longer book? Absolutely. It's not only a genre thing, but I, I do believe that the length of the book um, allows you to, to set higher prices. Although that being said, within the genre, even shorter books have, have managed to capture um, higher price points. It really comes down to your strategy. My, my strategy for this series was to get the highest amount of royalties for a book sale that I could. Um, and, and at the end of the day, have the highest amount of royalties because I knew I need, I'm living in Hawaii, it's an expensive place. My, the sales on my backlist was dwindling. And so I needed to put food on the table. So that was a huge motivator for me. Um, I wanted to provide as much value for money as I could as well. And so something I did um, with this particular series that's a little bit different is anytime I finished one of these long books i would then pick four or five characters that were my i thought were the most interesting but not necessarily well represented in terms of screen time in that particular story and i would write a short story somewhere between eight thousand and twenty thousand words for that character and what i had originally done is for each novel there was a, a fate marked origins you know companion story which was between 50 and 60,000 words. And so my, my original thought was I would put those out as well to create another income stream, as well as to give readers something extra to go to when they were waiting for the next book to come out or whatever. And then I quickly found that, especially because I released the first three books so quickly, readers were saying, I'm not interested. I want to get to the next book. I want to know what's happening next. So I changed my mind. I unpublished the, the origins novellas that I'd already done. And I took all of that material and stuck it at the end of the books for free. And then I raised the prices slightly, not on, not on book one. That one has always been three ninety nine, dollars um, with discounts usually to $99. But with the sequels, I went from four ninety nine dollars to $5.99. So I still sought to monetize those stories. Plus, I, I saw a huge increase in my, my Kindle Unlimited page reads at that point because rather than those readers getting to the end of the main novel, and then just moving on to the next one, they thought, hey, here's some free bonus content. And they would just continue to read on. And that, that had a huge impact on my page read numbers. Plus, I can't, I can't tell you how many reviews have specifically mentioned those short stories at the end saying, isn't it cool how this author thought to tell us more about this character who only gets 10 pages in the book and now has their own story and you learn about how they got to this point in the story. I was going to ask you real quick, you mentioned that you've written some children's books and I was going to kind of curious about uh, asking about that because uh, we've been told over and over that yeah, it's a very difficult genre to break into as I was wondering, you know, we might not telling us, you know, how well you did with that. And is this, is this something that was very easy to get a, a toehold in that genre? 
I unfortunately I have to echo the other's comments. Um, I have not had substantial success from an overall sales standpoint. That being said, um, it has been extremely rewarding. It's also been a great creative outlet um, and reminded me that my imagination can run as crazy in my adult and older books as it does in my, my children's books. And I do have a kind of a, an interesting experience, a really cool experience when it came to my children's books. I got a book bug deal for the first one in this, this Nikki Power Glove series, um, which is the adventures of Nikki Power Gloves. Basically this girl finds a che treasure chest full of multicolored gloves and each one gives her a different power. And over time she meets other kids that find different objects that give them powers and they all come together, try to figure out what it's all about. And what happened was when I did this book bug deal for book one, there was a, an elementary school teacher, a third grade teacher in Buffalo, South Dakota, who got her hands on it and read it, loved it, shared it with her students, incorporated it into her classroom. And then she was a part of this group of teachers across the, across the U.S. that they Skype with each other. And then they also Skype with what they call, you know, famous people or people that could help, help, value, help add value to their education. And so she got in touch with me after she was on to her second class that had all read, read the series. And so I started Skyping with them on a regular basis, as well as with um, the other, some of the other classrooms that she'd connected with and told about the book. So that did result in, in some book sales. Fast forward about four years, and she was on the verge of retirement. And she basically, as her going out wish, she wanted to bring me to Buffalo, South Dakota, and have me be a part of their school for a week. And so she ended up raising the money to get me out there and to basically present to each, it was a K through 12 type of situation. So I, I presented to each of those classrooms as well as some one room country schools around the area and just got to see the passion and the enthusiasm of these, these kids. And, you know, I could connect with the younger kids on the children's books, and then I could connect with the teenagers on some of my sci-fi dystopian stuff that had been con compared to the Hunger Games. So it was, it was amazing. Um, out of all, it's, it's crazy because even though my children's books, I wouldn't say that it has anything to do with my bottom line as a business, but that's, out of all my experiences, that's the one that stuck out to me the most. As a writer, how did you handle all the, the public exposure? Because there's a lot of us are predominantly introverted and we don't like public speaking. You know, I've been, I've been doing it for a while and I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who, if I'm afraid of something, um, I want to force myself to do it. And even though once I, I commit to it, I'm like, why did I just do that? That was stupid of me. Um, and so um, when I was back in the accounting world, I made this decision, even though I had, I do, I'm an introverted person. I had a fear of public speaking. I signed up to teach week long accountant trainings. And this was going to be about two months of my year. And these were, these were things where I was on my feet for eight hours a day for like a week at a time, standing in front of all these junior accountants and teaching them the most boring things in the history of the world. But what it proved to me is that I can do it. And so when I arrived in Hawaii and decided to become part of the community here, I, I basically, anytime an opportunity came up to be part of a career fair or they did a battle of the books here on the North Shore, I always just raised my hand and said, I'll do it. And then right after I would say, crap, why did I do that? I should have, I should have just kept my head down. It, this doesn't necessarily add that much to my bottom line. It's not a huge part of my business, but it gets me out of my comfort zone and it's just, it's a fun thing to be a part of. That's really cool. I have not been invited to South Dakota yet, so I'm a little envious. <laughs> it's a cool place actually. All right. I, that would be fun. Actually. I, that's really cool that they loved the book so much and, <laughs> and that you were someone that they wanted to bring in. And I like the idea you had of uh, adding your bonus content to the ends of the stories because it can be tough to sell short stories, you know, 99 cents and then you make 35 cents. And I always found that only some of the, the diehard fans would go buy them, but a lot of people would just buy the books. Yeah. And um, with Kindle Unlimited, of course, you get a bonus if you have more pages for people to read. So that makes even more sense there. Yeah, that's exactly right. So when you look at the, you look at the lengths of my, my novels, yes, they're, they're long in this series, but if you factor in, 
there is a chunk of that at the end that's this this bonus stuff these short stories which i felt were some of my some of my strongest writing because i really got to hone in on an individual character's growth and how they got from birth basically to where they are in the story the regular story and like I said, I got great feedback on it and I occasionally get some reviews that say, oh, I really love the whole book, but my favorite thing was actually this particular short story at the end because I love that character. And that's just, it's super rewarding. And like you said, it actually, I had thought it was taking away money from the overall royalties I would get, but in a way, it, I think it increased my ability to monetize the series because it's in Kindle Unlimited. It might've been a different story if it, if it wasn't in Kindle Unlimited. And do you have any tips? We get a lot of listeners that are maybe on their first or second book or, or maybe we're going to jump into a new genre. Do you have any tips for anybody who wants to maybe get into epic fantasy or, or military fantasy kind of at this? You've done this all in the last year, so you're pretty up to date on what's working now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the one thing that I've found about um, epic fantasy so far is that it feels like a genre that doesn't that isn't going to go away it's not a flash in the pan it's like i even though dystopian there are still success stories here and there i felt like that one that one comes about every 10 to 15 years people get obsessed with the end of the world and so stories like that do well or you might have a one-off but in terms of the longevity epic fantasy just feels like something that will be around for a long time so don't feel rushed don't feel like you're chasing some sort of fad that it, you're going to miss out if you don't get your book out there. Write the story that you have to tell and do it justice. Do all your characters justice. Give them that satisfying ending, regardless of who dies, um, that they're looking for. And you'll be rewarded because they're going to talk about it and they're going to start comparing it to other, other um, epic fantasies that they loved. And for me personally, um, the message to myself when I started writing this was don't be scared because I, I grew up reading Tolkien as many of us have. And, but I, I don't know if I'm the norm in that I wrote, I read Lord of the Rings probably a dozen times before I was 12. And it was the one where I, I loved reading other books too, but I kept going back to it. And I could pick it up on any given day and want to read it again. And so I, the reason I didn't write fantasy right away is because I was scared. I didn't, I didn't want to, not do justice to a genre that was so near and dear to my heart. So I figured, oh, I'll write this other stuff that I enjoy, but it's not really, it's not really my true passion. And so I just finally, I felt like after writing 25 other books, I felt like I was finally at a point where I could do the genre justice. And so it's been the most um, kind of inspiring thing to, to actually see some, some readers jump on it and enjoy it. All right, cool. Uh, we're right at the hour, so I'm going to just move into our last little section here. Um, so you've got one book in ACX, right? The audiobook. That's correct. We're starting to see uh, there are new distri uh, audiobook distributors that are starting to get a foothold. Find Away Voices is one of them, and uh, Google Play just got into distributing audiobooks. So do you think that like now that that's happening, you're going to maybe dip your toe back into self-production, or do you think that you still feel that the, uh, uh, the traditional route is more effective for audiobooks? Um, you know, I've, I've been feeling more and more inspired to potentially dip into um, self-production. I, I have had a tremendous experience with, with Podium. Um, so to be honest, if, they, if, if I wrote my next series and they said, oh, we're interested and they wanted to offer me a deal again, I would likely take them up on it. But if they said no, for whatever reason, they, they have enough in that genre or they they have other things to work on, then um, I would, I would go for it again, I think this time, but I would, um, I would really go for the narrator that I absolutely wanted for that particular series. Um, somebody like Nick Podell, who stands out. I have a number of other author friends who have had the pleasure of working with him and have said, said great things. Um, as well as he's just got, you know, kind of a one of a kind way of delivering the stories. So I, I would do it, um, but I would be, I would be very patient. And if I had to schedule the narrator I wanted and they didn't have an opening for a year, I would wait the year and get that particular narrator rather than trying to rush into it, which is kind of what I did last time. Even though I got Kate Rudd, who did a terrific job, I didn't really have a plan and I kind of just rushed into it and it, it 
has hurt the success of that that series. Yeah, that pretty much you know ties right into my last question for a good chunk of it. Because I wrote in here like, when it comes to creating your audiobooks, how important it is for you to find the right voice. You know, listening to all your auditions, vocal inflections, ease of listening, speed in which they talk. I mean, how important was it for you to find the right person, and how easy was it for you to find the right person? Yeah, I mean, when I did my own self production, I mean, it was I was fortunate enough to. The kind of actually kind of the way it went about I wasn't planning on doing an audiobook for it um, it, it had been a while since I'd released a book and I really I was going to release this one standalone novel and I had no plans for audio and then I actually I sent the book for for potential blurbs and I sent it to a few authors that I had a good connection with that had decent followings and one of them was Risa Walker who wrote Time Bounds, um, which won the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award one year, and then she got the deal with Amazon, and it pretty much just, that, that series absolutely took off. And so I'd had a good relationship with her, and she, she read this book called Strings, which is my standalone, and loved it. And she actually said, hey, have you thought about the audio for it? And um, I hadn't at that point. And so um, she started tossing around some names of people she'd worked with, including Kate Rudd. And so I kind of gravitated toward toward that um, name in particular but I think for any series you have to be you have to believe that they can deliver the same story that you intended to tell Um, they might have a slightly different spin on it and that's okay because they need their artistic creativity too but it it still has to hit the core of the story and tug at all the right heartstrings Um, so yeah I think that's crucial to the success of an audiobook all right. Well, we're going to kind of wrap things up there. I have one final question because you've kind of mentioned, oh, I know this person in this Facebook group and I had this person announce my book. For those out there that, you know, we've talked about how introverted a lot of us are that are thinking, well, how can I get on the radar of some people that may be like influential in my genre? Do you have any suggestions? I mean, get creative. So I can give you a little bit of a story behind how many, how, how I know a lot of these other authors, um, some of which are traditional, some of which are hybrid and some of which are self-published. Um, it really started with my Goodreads group. So this was set up as a fan group and I hated it from the very beginning because at the time the Moon Dwellers was doing really well, but I wasn't, um, I didn't think of myself as somebody that should have fans and that should have a place where you go to just talk about my books. And so I ended up saying the heck with that. And let's set it up as kind of just another group for readers that happens to be my fan group. And so we we set this up and it it started to grow really rapidly, which was awesome. Um, And so, you know, when it got to be a couple thousand members, I ended up um, coming up with the idea for a program, which would be to invite all in the spirit of it not being about me because that was the last thing I wanted the um, inviting other authors to come and do like live Q and A's with, with the group of voracious readers that I had. And so we said from day one, let's just go after big names because not only will it attract more people to the group, but why not? Everyone's talking about how can I make a bigger splash on Goodreads? How can I use this as, as part of my platform? And so we hit up everyone and we got people like Marissa Meyer who wrote New York times bestseller Cinder. She came on within the first couple months. Hugh Howie, of course, he'll, he, he's always really willing to do things like this. Neil Schusterman. Um, and Risa was, was one of the names, but we had pretty much every week we had a new um, top selling author um, that kind of fit in with, with what people like to read in the group. So um, that's how I made connections with a lot of these people, um, a lot of these authors. And then I've, I've not, I don't want to say use these connections, but I've certainly um, nourished them and I've kept in touch with those who I felt that I had my own personal connection with. Um, And then from time to time, you know, I'll ask them how their books are doing. I'll help them by sharing one of their new books if I've, you know, enjoyed it and I've read it. And then I'll ask them to do the same for me. And so that's kind of how it started. Um, And then I guess more recently what I've done is, is just be, fearless, I guess. I mean, Lindsay knows I already hit her up for a a potential cross promo, which she politely declined (laughs) because she hasn't read my book, which is, which is very um, appropriate of her. And then, but others I've, you know, they've just decided that we're, we're sitting in the same group in some category. Uh, Brandon Sanderson also declined, by the way. Um, But that's the, I, I will go after anyone to just say, Hey, I'd love to give you a copy of my book. If it's not your cup of tea, then, hey, we're in the same genre. Would you be willing to, 
to do a promo together. And so that's how I've met other people like Michael J. Sullivan, Phil Tucker, and some other kind of um, Duncan Hamilton, some other big names in my particular genre. So yeah, if you're, if you're nervous about it, I mean, most of us are pretty down to earth and I get questions all the time from other authors who are aspiring or just starting out. So just email. I mean, the contact information is usually there. Go on Facebook, go on email, go on Goodreads, whatever it is, and just contact someone and just talk to them like normal human beings. Awesome. And I love that uh, this Q&A thing is great because you were also giving them a chance to promote themselves to your, your big group of fantasy fans. So you kind of did something cool for them probably before saying, hey, by the way, I got a book coming yeah, was, out in case you, know, you want to mention it. That's true. It was a really win-win. And that's certainly how we sold it to them was it was your chance to hit our voracious group of readers. But on the back end of that, I was definitely holding out my hand, not for a handout, but just for, you know, how can we help each other? And how, how can we, if, if our readers, if we share similar readers, then how can we, you know, kind of go forward together? So yeah, it's been, it's been a cool experience. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in here on uh, where we recorded this on Sunday. <laughs> not awesome. our usual day, but I'll be getting it out this week soon. And uh, we appreciate all the great questions. I think you're the first person that's kind of talked about military fantasies. So that was really cool. And um, would you like to tell us maybe what you're working on now? Remind us of the name of your book that you want people to check it out and uh, where they can find you online. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, you know, I, I certainly considered delving right back into epic fantasy. And yes, I have another epic series that I want to write, but um, I'm the kind of person who can get a bit distracted attracted by shiny things and so I've seen I've been reading and seeing a lot of um, kind of space fantasy I'm not sure what the actual title of the genre is but it's been around forever because Star Wars is a good example of it where you've got kind of a mix of magical type stuff with technology um, so I, I started writing a, a space fantasy series um, which is working title is Starborn Mage and it's going to be a book one in the Godstar Chronicles and um, this one, ele short elevator pitch is essentially it's you know, years and years in the future and you've got kind of this galaxy that everyone believes was, was formed from the hearts of the, the gods that were in this epic battle. And magic is their blood, which is basically, it's, a, it's something that can be bought and sold. You know, it's liquid, it comes in the ground, you can mine it like oil. And um, for those who have the ability to use it, which is only a select few, it's very valuable to them, to everyone else. It's something like alcohol. They can drink and get a bit of a buzz from it, but they can't actually use it to create a spell. So that's when I finished the first book and it's with my beta readers. So I'm just fingers crossed here, hoping to hear good things from them when it comes back. Um, but sorry to just loop into the other, the questions from earlier. I am going to, I am planning to release all three books in this series in short succession. So I'm going to write all three before I do anything with it. So June, June, July timeframe is kind of my target for it. Um, in terms of finding me online, I mean, like many of us who've been around for a while, you can find me pretty much anywhere. Um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, David Estes Books. If you look that up, you'll find me. Um, as well as you can um, find me on Goodreads and you can join my group if you're interested. David Estes Fans and Book Lovers Unite. Um, or I recently set up a, a Patreon page, which we didn't get the chance to talk about, but um, that's something that I'm starting to nourish. So. If anyone is interested after reading my books or just because, um, I'm going to start to provide free, um, not free, but if, through your patronage, um, exclusive access to advanced chapters from my coming books. So each week or so, I'll release a couple more chapters. So you'll get to read these books way before June and July as they're evolving and basically as I'm writing them. All right. Very cool. Yeah. Somehow we filled up the hour here and, uh, but you're brand new on Patreon. So maybe we can have you come off back in like a year or so and get an update yeah. on how the space fantasy went and, and how Patreon and all your other projects are going too. That would be yeah. awesome. Absolutely. Thanks. I, I appreciate being here and, and thanks for having me on the show and yeah. aloha. Yeah, it was <laughs> nice to meet you, David. Thanks for all the info. So, all right uh, and everybody listening that'll be episode 169 on marketing sff.com if you want to come by and i'll have all david's links on there so you can stock them on goodreads and stuff uh, that's it everyone thanks all right take it easy bye, -bye.